This video is sponsored by Movie Palette. Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, former Lord of the Dance Michael Flatley writes, produces, directs, and stars in the spy thriller Blackbird, which could become 2022's definitive So Bad It's Good movie. Ten years after he retired from espionage following his wife's murder, Victor Blackley, codenamed Blackbird, played by Michael Flatley, operates a hotel and nightclub in Barbados called the Blue Moon. However, he's pulled back into his past when his old flame Vivian, played by Nicole Evans, checks in with her fiancé Blake Molyneux, played by Eric Roberts, an arms dealer posing as an entrepreneur who is in possession of a stolen formula that could kill millions in the wrong hands. To rescue Vivian and save the world, the Blackbird will take flight once again. If you thought Riverdance getting its own animated movie was weird, try the fact that Michael Flatley has written, produced, directed, and starred in his own action movie. Everybody, Welcome to Blackbird! Not to be confused with the Apple TV series of the same name, or the Kate Winslet Susan Sarandon film that came out during the pandemic, no 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 If you're a bad movie fan, you've probably been following this story for quite a few years now. This was originally announced all the way back in 2018, and it premiered that year at London's Rain Dance Film Festival. But rather mysteriously, all the critics that were invited to the screening were suddenly disinvited hours beforehand. Flatley has since claimed that that was a work in progress screening and that was why that happened, but certainly a myth has built around the movie ever since, especially because it completely disappeared thereafter. No one knew what exactly happened to it, and that was the situation for years up until 2021, when suddenly Blackbird reappeared at the Monaco Streaming Film Festival, where Flatley won Best Actor. And while I'm not even going to challenge the legitimacy of the Monaco Streaming Film Festival, rather ironically, it didn't stream at the festival. It actually played in person in Monaco. And so again, questions were being raised about well, will it actually see a release? Is it just a glorified home movie for Michael Flatley? And then, suddenly, Irish distributor Wildcard actually bought the movie, and now they've distributed it in the UK and Ireland, and oh boy, was I excited to get the chance to see it. Now, I actually saw this movie in the best possible circumstances. You might recall that a few months ago, I did a video about the former Bristol IMAX. Well, I actually saw it on that very screen. That's right, Michael Flatley in IMAX. That's because Tai Singh, who was interviewed in that video, is part of the Bristol Bad Film Club, and he has been obsessed with trying to see this movie for years. And then when he got the chance to schedule it for a one-off event, he leapt at it. He came out in a suit, personally introduced the film beforehand, and then brought out a bunch of young Bristol dancers who did a full Irish dance routine before the movie. And me and 200 bad movie fans who were in attendance were all anxiously awaiting the movie, but also weren't quite sure what we were going to see because it had been so shrouded in secrecy. And then the movie unfolded, and I think I had one of the greatest nights of my life. Like, genuinely, watching Blackbird in that screening... I felt like I was watching a new So Bad It's Good legend actually being born before my eyes. I think the moment that we all realised the film was going to be just as bad as legendarily rumoured was when it opened with not one, but two unintentionally hilarious smash cuts in the first few minutes of the movie, before the title even appears on screen, in fact. The movie opens with this romantic montage of Flatley's Victor Blackley and his wife, and they're very much gazing into each other's eyes. They're looking right down the barrel of the lens and cross-cut with each other, which is extremely awkward on a very big screen, but then immediately cut right into the wife's funeral, pouring rain everywhere, 
And suddenly the audience explodes into laughter at the juxtaposition for the first time, but certainly not the last. And then Flatley managed to pull off the trick to a slightly lesser extent a few moments later where all the mourners go inside. The property incidentally is owned by Michael Flatley. I believe it's currently up for sale at the time of this video, but they're all talking about him still. They're all wondering, well, what's he going to do now that his wife has died? And that question, is immediately answered by another smash cut to Flatley still standing at his wife's grave, even though it is chucking it down with rain and quite a substantial portion of time is implied to have passed, but he's still standing frozen in exactly the same position, and again the audience laugh, which is probably not what Flatley intended for the opening of his movie. If you're wondering what Blackbird is, I can answer that very concisely for you. It's Casino Royale meets Casablanca, with Flatley casting himself as James Bond and Humphrey Bogart all rolled into one. That's right. Michael Flatley has created a movie where he himself is the center of its entire universe. In fact, the hotel nightclub that his character owns, the Blue Moon, is basically the setting for 70% of the entire film. And Flatley's Blackley, a character clearly named, so that it rhymes with his own name, he actually, every single night, goes down to the restaurant and personally introduces himself to all of the patrons and they're all like oh my goodness we got to meet victor blackley i mean michael flatley like why would they have that kind of reaction to a retired spy who i guess has entirely disposed of the idea of keeping a low-key presence of himself but of course that becomes moot because the entire film is basically an ego trip and flatley has claimed in some interviews oh it's not a Verity project, it's just that the director and writer that I hired, they fell through, so I decided I was just going to make it myself. Sure. Flatley's reputation is notorious at this point, especially the fact that he does not work well with other collaborators. This is a rich man's folly. This is someone that has the money and the power to make their fantasies come to life and be completely unaccountable to anyone other than themselves. It's a beautiful position to be in if you can afford it, but also a rather perilous one because you don't get those nagging voices of dissent that ask, why are you doing things that way? I'm not sure about that particular choice. Like, for example, there is a scene where Blackley is sitting in a church mourning his sins and his late wife, and he's doing so in a yellow pattern jacket, which surely anyone would have said, that's a little bit inappropriate for the tone of the scene and a bit distracting for the audience, but not Michael Flatley. Michael Flatley's wardrobe throughout the entire movie deserves a discussion in of itself because it is fascinating. So you've of course got the classic James Bond look with the white tuxedo, very Roger Moore there, but Flatley has a very signature look, namely the fact that he likes to wear his button shirts about three or four buttons down to about the mid chest level so you know you get a little bit of the chest kind of poking out there but also he likes to wear that in combo with a hat at a very jaunty angle exactly like this michael flatley wanders into many scenes completely cocksure like this it is absolutely ridiculous. He even wears his hat at his wife's funeral at a jaunty angle in the opening scene. Like, he thinks he is the most suave person in the world. This absolutely signature look. And like, who wears a hat like this? One of my favourite bits of ridiculous business in this movie is that there is a moment where uncharacteristically Michael Flatley is wearing a flat cap instead of his signature hat. And so he's got this in combination with his three buttons down look, which is you know, quite a look in of itself. But then, as he's continuing his conversation through the lobby of his hotel, suddenly one of the staff runs in and exchanges hats with him midway through the scene. Like, there's just this random bit of business. Apparently, there's just someone in the hotel that just entirely works as, like, a hat swapper. And the audience exploded at this moment, especially because this is meant to be a sort of serious conversation between the two characters. And then there's just 
this thing going on in the midst of it. But even when he's not wearing clothing, Flatley still manages to possess a bit of ego about himself because there is a scene, I kid you not, that is literally just him looking at himself in a mirror, shirtless, applying shaving cream to his face. And that's literally the entire scene. He doesn't shave or do anything. That's literally it. Just like a 30 second awkward scene of him looking at his own body and by extension us. As if to say, yeah, look at how good I am. And this combination of self arts director and unfiltered vanity should almost certainly evoke the likes of Ty Wiseau and Neil Breen. And while Blackbird is more technically accomplished than any film from those two directors, it deserves those comparisons. In fact, the only way it could get more narcissistic is if it totally copied Steven Seagal's On Deadly Ground and instead a load of ADR talking about how great Victor Blackley is, as opposed to most of the dialogue. But like Breen and Wiseau, because the film is so uniquely personal, it becomes unintentionally revealing. If you're aware of Flatley's politics, for example, you'll probably raise an eyebrow at the fact that the most prominent black character in the film is his right-hand man named Matiti, a character name that itself should probably raise some red flags, who just basically takes orders without question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's a character that looks like they wander out of a movie from the 1940s. And making things even worse is that Michael Flatley almost follows the James Bond fantasy to its most uncomfortable places. It's very hard to not notice the fact that the male cast is predominantly middle-aged and the women in the film are about half their age and that includes Blackley's wife which kind of makes you wonder how old were they when they met but either way the movie desperately wants you to think that Flatley is a sex symbol to the point that early on a woman actually approaches him and says you're looking very handsome today really did you write this yourself, Michael? In fact, speaking of that, there is a character in the movie, a lounge singer, that exists with two character traits. One, repeatedly singing Mac the Knife over and over again, and desperately wanting to Mac Victor Blackley's knife. There is literally a character that solely exists because she desperately wants to bang Michael Flatley, I mean Victor Blackley, to the point where she becomes jealous of other women. And this reaches its particular low lies with a scene where she wanders into Blackley's hotel room unprompted and strips off for him, trying to seduce him. And the entire audience in my screen bristled uncomfortably at the prospect of a Michael Flatley sex scene. But Flatley decides he's going to be the gentleman. He's going to cover her up and then escort her out the room and reject her advances. And she doesn't quite understand why, but he knows better. And of course, that means that Flatley can have his cake and eat it. He can have a scene where a woman disrobes for him because he's that sexually desirable, but also he's a privileged man that doesn't take advantage of women. He's a good guy. But you still wrote it, didn't you, Michael? And I've spoken about him this long, and I haven't talked about his acting yet. Terrible, if you're wondering. Like the fact that he won a Best Actor award somewhere? Yeah, that seems a little bit suspect, because Flatley is laughably unconvincing as a spy, as you probably expected, but he sort of gets away with it when he doesn't have to deliver dialogue. But when he does, Flatley by name, Flatley by nature. He is so monotone in his deliveries. It's remarkable how inexpressive he is in both voice and face, to the point where the character feels like a blank at times. Flatley even manages to seem like he's confused about what scene he's in, a remarkable trick for a movie that he wrote and directed. Flatley's performance is so bad at points, it renders some scenes unintentionally funny. There's a moment where Eric Roberts' bad guy is trying to intimidate him and goes, Victor Blackley. And gormlessly, almost seemingly obliviously, Flatley just turns around and goes, yes, I'm Victor Blackley. <laughs> like, that was 
was the take you kept in the movie? And the problem is that Flatley is written a role that requires him to be romantic and emotional, and he can't sell either of those things. He even gives his character a tragic backstory. We constantly get flashbacks to his wife's death that are incomprehensibly edited at times, and they keep cutting back to the same shot of him just anguished in emotion at the event, and it just looks like he's grimacing a scream. In fact, the only time that Flatley actually seems to show any kind of emotion is when his character gets truly angry, and then at that point, he's firing on all cylinders as he puts it. Although really, he just escalates into being like a melted candle version of Liam Neeson. It is genuinely embarrassing to watch. But in Flatley's defense, no one's acting is particularly good in this film. I think it says something that the best performance in Blackbird comes from Eric Roberts of all people, a man who has so many bad movies on his CV that he probably knows precisely what kind of film he's in, and it's just having fun with it. He has it up as his version of a Bond villain, basically, and spends the entire film just grinning from end to end like a Cheshire cat. Although, let's face it, if I got a free holiday out of the deal, I'd probably be grinning too. But at least Roberts looks like he's enjoying himself, which is more than can be said for much of the rest of the cast. Game of Thrones' Ian Beatty plays Blackley's friend Nick, who spends the entire film in a flop sweat being grumpy and ill-tempered and generally not doing very much. Meanwhile, you've got Nicole Evans as the love interest Vivian, who is meant to be the Ingrid Bergman of the movie. Somehow flatly manages to restrain himself from having his character to say, of all the hotels she could have booked herself into in the world, she walked into mine. But nevertheless, they are rekindling their old friendship. She's another spy that used to be part of the same agency, and so they had a bit of a thing together before Blackley got married. I'm not sure when that would be, considering, you know, his wife was probably something that he was with for a while, and she's about half his age to begin with. Again, I'm not sure about the logistics of that. Evans and Flatley don't have chemistry with each other, which is the fundamental problem. But also, Evans's character is written a abysmally. Despite the fact that she is a former spy, she somehow managed to fall in love with arms dealer Roberts completely obliviously. That was not a deliberate undercover choice on her part. She accidentally fell in love with an actual war criminal. Oops, I guess you completely forget your instincts and training every once in a while. Never mind. Also, I'm not sure if Evans' performance can really be helped when she's given such wonderful pearls of dialogue like, You keep underestimating him. He's the blackbird, you fool! Yes, that's right. Michael Flatley really is the anti-triple threat in terms of writing and direction. Some of the dialogue in this movie is so so bad that I was actually struggling to be able to hear some of it because the audience was laughing at it so often. One of the best examples of how bad Flatley's writing is is the MacGuffin. The whole film centers around a stolen formula that Blake has come to the hotel to trade because he's like Le Chiffre in Casino Royale. He's a middleman for much more dangerous types, the sort of not spectre that's built up in the fringes of this movie, but purportedly this formula could cure all illness and disease around the world, but if it falls into the wrong hands and it's altered even slightly, well then it can become a bioweapon that can kill scores of people. And in the huge slab of exposition in which this is delivered, the characters literally say that they think it's going to be used as a way of eliminating undesirables, i.e. poor, poverty-stricken people so that their neighborhoods can be gentrified. And Blackley, after this, literally goes, well, what exactly does that mean? I think it means exactly what you think it does. It's not exactly subtle. And that's the kind of writing that plagues the entire film. That scene in particular really reminded me of a moment out of Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, except that show is a parody. It's literally making fun of this kind of genre slop that is completely vanity driven. But Blackbird is like watching that made in 
absolute seriousness. And then on top of that, you got Flatley's clumsy direction. The whole spy film element of it is very weirdly handled, particularly the scenes back in London with the Chieftains, which is the organisation that Blackley worked for, and they're led by Patrick Bergen's The Head, who is clearly meant to be a surrogate for M. Bergen, of course, being no stranger to a lot of very bad films himself. But he's only in about three scenes of this movie anyway, which again are mostly where can we find Victor Blackley? Nevertheless, these scenes back in London, they have this kind of weird 1960s vibe, which seems like a deliberate conscious choice, but it's very weird to have spies in this day and age going around in offices with frosted glass windows or rotary telephones. Rotary telephones are everywhere in this movie. Or delivering messages in bright red telephone boxes. It feels like a completely different era. And then you've got this opening sequence, which is unintentionally funny because the spy whose formula gets stolen from him, he thinks he's being pursued by a couple of men. And he's very right because as he walks across the bridge, the camera cuts back and you literally see a group of three men shadowing behind him about 10 steps from where he is. It's ridiculous. They're literally right behind him. It's almost like a comedy moment moment by accident. In the hands of a better director, this would be a kind of style, but in Flatley's hands, it just makes you go, what year is this supposed to be set? It was only when a character pulled out a laptop that I suddenly realised, oh, it's supposed to be present day. And the true powers of Flatley's terrible writing and Len direction truly combine in one of the film's major highlights, a quote, gentleman's game of Texas Hold'em between Victor and Blake. You know the whole thing in Bond movies where Bond challenges the villain of the movie to a card game and they match wits with one another? Casino Royale uses this extensively to build tension and suspense in the card games. Well, what if they did that but they got none of the tension or suspense out of that situation. What if the entire sequence was completely DOA? And what if, instead of the hero and the villain trading barbs at one another that's genuinely quite intelligent and witty, what if they weren't? What if instead they were literally just trading straight up insults with one another? In fact, Blake says to Blackley, you're a washed up secret agent. And in the pause after Wash Up, I genuinely thought he was just going to say Dancer, because it probably would have been correct. But undeterred, Blackley has a retort of his own. You have a narcissistic personality. Well, it takes one to know one, am I right? Which brings us to the action sequences in this movie, or lack thereof, because the amount of action in Blackbird could barely even fill up a trailer. Now, I knew that Flatley probably wasn't going to do a lot of physically exerting action on account of the fact that he's a retired dancer, and he has numerous injuries over the years, but he did used to be a boxer before he became a dancer. So you might think, oh, well, he could handle himself in a fight scene. Well, absolutely not, based on this evidence. The most significant fight scene in Blackbird is a moment where Blackley takes on Blake's henchman, and that lasts roughly around 15 seconds, and I'm being generous. Like, Flatley somehow wants us to think that he can take down this guy that is literally half his age and twice his size that quickly. Absolutely preposterous. In fact, I knew that the action was going to be bad when we see in one of the flashback scenes Flatley literally struggling to try and walk down a hillside. Geriatric is definitely the descriptor here. In fact, the action is so bad that at the climax of the movie, which is a huge anti-climax in fact because much of it takes place off screen, there is a moment where Blackley is taken aside by a bunch of goons on this dock. They go round a corner behind these shipping containers, and then suddenly you hear fight scene sound effects, like biff, boff, bash, and the characters are just sort of reacting. And then Blackley just walks out from behind, and he's all bloodied now, and the fight scene is just implied. That is literally a bit that I have seen in comedy 
comedy bit. And they did this for real in the actual spy movie that they wanted to take seriously. It's hilarious. Like, genuinely, flatly, does not seem to understand the language of film or the medium that he's working in. It's breathtaking. And the amount of effort the movie goes to avoid having any action in it, if at all possible, is impressive, right down to a shootout that accidentally seems to be a tribute to the one at the end of Desperado. Blackbird is a disaster piece. The movie is so comically inept in almost everything that attempts, and is so unabashedly a vanity project that you can't help but laugh at it. If you're a bad movie fan, you have to track this down, and ideally see it with the same kind of audience that I did, or at least a group of friends that are waiting to rip jokes at its expense. I made a lot of fun of Michael Flatley in this review, but genuinely, this film is a gift. This is the room of spy thrillers, and like that film, I genuinely think it could go on to have a long second life at rep theatres, getting programmed periodically for audiences to share together in the joke and create in jokes around the movie. You know how the spoons thing kind of defines the room? I can see the hats defining Blackbird. I think the only way the movie doesn't become something like that is if Michael Flatley tries to stop that from happening to save his ego. And I think this Blackbird should just be allowed to fly free. You've probably seen this swish thing in the background of the entire video. This is a movie palette. It takes the colour tone of an entire movie and turns it into this artwork. So each of these lines represents a scene or sequences from the entire movie. In this case, this is Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And if you would like a movie palette of your own, then you can go to moviepalette.com and use the code FILMBRAIN15 to get 15% off your order. And thanks again to Movie Palette for sponsoring this video. If you like this review and you want to support my work, you can give me a tip at my Ko-fi page or my YouTube Super Thanks feature, which is right below the video. Or you can buy some merch from my brand new T Public page. Or you can even tap dance your way over to my Patreon, where you can see my reviews early, among other perks, including access to my Discord server. But until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out.